Sustainability Series. My name is Meg Gray, and I'm the Science and Technology Librarian at PPL. And this series is an ongoing uh, partnership between the Library and the Southern Maine Conservation Collaborative. And this is Jess, she's the Executive Director of that organization. And we've been doing this for almost two years. Um, we aspire to bring a, a diverse group of speakers to share different aspects of the work that they made, made towards greater endurance and sustainability. And we typically meet here in the Ryan's Auditorium on the fourth Wednesday of the month at around 5.30 p.m. Next month, um, we're really excited. We're partnering with several other area organizations, and we're going to be screening the documentary Donland at 6 p.m. on October 24th. So we hope that you'll come and, and uh, join us for a free showing of this movie. It's a moving and groundbreaking film about the Maine Wabanaki Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the first of its kind in the nation. And we're pleased to welcome two, two special guests who are integral in the creation of the film. And we will also be joined by students from the Telling Room, and they'll be presenting pieces created specifically for the occasion. Tonight is sort of our kickoff for the season, and we're very pleased to have Nat Wheel right here. He co-wrote The Naturalist's Notebook, and he's a professor at Bowdoin, and tonight he's going to describe the origin of the project and the joys, the challenges, and fulfillment of keeping a systematic picture journal. Just going to introduce him. Hi. Um, I'm Jess Burton, and I direct the Southern Maine Conservation Collaborative. We're an organization based here in Portland, and we work with uh, 19 land and water conservation organizations that focus their work in Southern Maine. We provide services to those organizations, and we also provide a space for them to work together to think about cross-boundary and broader conservation projects. Um, so our, basically our core is about relationship, and that's what is so special about our relationship with the Portland Public Library and the series that we um, partner with them um, to produce. And the, the variety of speakers we've had over the last two years tremendous and um, we're just so excited to be thinking about future topics. If any of you in the audience is a speaker or knows of interesting topics that could have a voice here in Portland, please um, contact one of us um, at some point either today or if you want to get, reach out to us by email or phone. So we're thrilled to have Nat tonight. We've um, been waiting. We scheduled this a whole while ago and we're, we're really excited and we've been waiting for this. Um, so Nat co-author of the Naturalist Notebook with Baron Heinrich, one of my um, favorite authors also. He is uh, the vast professor of natural sciences at Bowdoin uh, and the 2015 wonder, uh, winner of the Ecological Society of America's Odom Award for Excellence in Ecological Education. He is the author of numerous scientific publications and the co-editor of Monteverde, Ecology and Conservation of a Tropical Cloud Forest. Um, he recently released a very exciting project, which you may have heard of, called Nature Moments, that he will talk a little bit about. Um, and he's about to head out on an adventure to Colombia to teach there for four months. So we're thrilled to get, her, get him in this window of time. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. Thanks, Thank Nate. <clears throat> Oh, thanks, everybody. If I speak like this, can you hear me OK? Or would you prefer me to be behind the mic? All good like this? Um, so it's an it's a intimate crowd. Let's make this informal. Feel free to pepper me with questions. I'm going to actually pepper you with some questions and quiz you. I, I've had a decades of being a university professor, so I just can't quit. And I see a whole bunch of pupils here that I'm going to put to work. So what I'm going to do in the next uh, 45 minutes or 50 minutes is to give a, a very brief overview, my perspective on nature journaling. And then I want to talk about the origins of this book project with Baron Heinrich, give you kind of a boiled down five tips on how to be a naturalist. And I'm guessing there's some pretty good naturalists already in the audience. And you may have some of your own tips to share. I'll show you one of the nature moments to uh, kind of give you a sense of the progression of my own thinking and more than that, my own sense of the importance of putting to knowledge to action or just getting involved to try to make the world a better place. And then if there's time and you still look like you um, are, are ready for some more, I might do a very short reading from the book. 
Um, so let's start with um, just a little bit of biology. Um, I went to a talk the other day uh, by Tom Fleischner, who's the director of the Institute, uh, the Natural History Institute in uh, Prescott, Arizona. And he cited a paper which I just love. It was published in 2015 in, 2000, in uh, the Journal of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, one of the most prestigious journals, scientific journals. And the conclusions of the authors, after a controlled experiment, was that going on nature walks and thinking about nature reduces the frequency of morbid ruminations. I love that term. It's a, apparently it's a clinical term, but essentially it's a precursor to the nature of mental illness. So if you have morbid ruminations about the state of the world these days, go for a nature walk uh, and take some notes. Um, and this book may give you some um, guidance about how to do it. I'm sure you can check it out at the library for free, and you can, um, and I've got one of the nature moments that tells you how to make your own for free as well. I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, I decided to write this book after I reacquainted myself with a book I didn't even know I had been taught from. Uh, Anna Comstock, Anna Bosford Comstock, wrote a book called The Handbook of Nature Study in the early 20th century. And I'm guessing from some of the people my age here that you probably either read this book or were taught, like I was, by somebody who had read this book. Is anybody, is anybody familiar with this book? Well, and the origins are really quite interesting. Uh, they, in, this book is a, is a, is a giant book. I'll, I'll make a comment about that in just a moment. Um, but its origin was a series of pamphlets that the New York State Agriculture Department produced because in the late 1800s in New York, a lot of people were leaving the countryside, going to New York City, and there was an agricultural depression. There simply was not enough food. Farmers were not producing food for the many people who were in the cities. And people seemed to be getting, seemed to be losing touch with nature. So they thought the way to inspire young future farmers and solve this very real food need, food shortage need, was to turn young people onto nature. So these little pamphlets began, you know, how to track, how to make uh, plaster casts of raccoon tracks. Remember that? Anybody do that? Um, or how to uh, spatter a toothbrush dipped into ink on a screen with a fern on a white piece of paper and then lift the fern and you have this beautiful silhouette of the fern. That's all in this series of pamphlets. And Anna Comstock put it together into this handbook of nature study. She says something very interesting at the beginning of this book. It's 887 pages. It weighs several pounds. She apologizes for the length of the book. It does not contain more than any intelligent this. country child of 12 should know about his environment, naturally, and without effort. So the, she just expected, and really anticipated, that people were losing the ability, that everybody should know this, but they didn't understand, essentially, ecological literacy. So this sort of uh, echo, it's an echo of what we, uh, many people talk about today, but um, I think 100 years ago, she was despairing about what people did not know about nature. They knew a heck of a lot more about nature than they do today, most people. So I thought, okay, well, what can I do? What do I know that can maybe uh, help people re-engage with nature? And I thought nature journaling was a good place to start. By, because this is something I've done for um, pretty, I won't say intently, because or, ten, or intensely, because it's actually it's a very easy thing for me to do. But with some concentration, I've been doing it for a little over 30 years now. And I was curious about the origins of nature journaling. It actually goes back before Thoreau. I'll make a comment about Thoreau. But Gilbert White was one of the first formal nature journalists. He was a British uh, parson. And he referred to his very parochial view of the world, but he didn't mean parochial in the kind of negative way that we think of it. 
he meant parochial because it was a country parish. That was uh, that's what the term referred to. And he knew everything about nature in his parish and wrote it down in the Natural History of Selborne, which is actually one of the most widely published books. It's not all that well known today, but it's had more than 200 editions. So right up there in terms of the number of publications that it's had. So he was, we, we credit Gilbert White from these uh, late 1700s as being one of the first nature journalists. But the more famous one, more familiar one for Americans anyway, is Henry David Thoreau, uh, who published a journal that had a quarter of a million words in it. So it was uh, like <laughs> um, One of the points I want to, probably the major point I want to leave you with is that the way he did his journal was, was, was historical, epic, crucial for literature and philosophy and for the foundation of conservation but actually was way too wordy to be useful as a, a way for people to nature journal. So I'm going to make a point that a lot of what you will read about how to make how to do a nature journal, I'm quite sure is not the way to increase your understanding of nature. It's a great way to sort of avoid morbid ruminations and, and to uh, sort of put stuff in, but not a good way to pull it out. And Thoreau realized that himself late in his life, after he started to become exposed to uh, Darwin's origin of species, published in 1859. So quite late in his life, and some of the he began to hang around with scientists at the uh, uh, Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard. I'm not even positive it was called that then. Um, and he went back to his journal and he started to pull stuff out laboriously out of these sifting through these quarter of a million words. And he produced, for the first time now, a really workable way to synthesize his, his very careful observations of nature, which had been kind of buried. And he produced tables like this. When I first came upon this table, which was actually late in the writing of our book, I thought, oh my god, Thoreau has, has scooped me again. <laughs> um, because this is very similar to the format that we use. And what he's got across here are the years, 1852, uh, 1853, and so on. Actually, interestingly, Meg has given me a mug with water in it that says, I love spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a spreadsheet. That's actually what Thoreau pulled this stuff out. And he was interested in when white pine, that's his handwriting on the left, and I've just typed to the right so you can read it a little better. When white pine, pitch pine, red pines in the converse, lots of broadleaf trees, leafed out. So this is his table of when they leafed out in different years. So it was an early exercise in mindfulness about a simple thing, like when do you see fresh green foliage of conifers? And does it differ between years? And the only way to answer that question, without having to read a quarter million words, is to pull it out and put it in a table and then scan your eye up and down and left and right. You can compare it between species, you can compare it between years. So that was a real breakthrough, really. But it, again, he, even though he's using data from 10 years before he died, um, he, he actually didn't synthesize it until the early 60s, really his last few, few years. So there are lots of wonderful books out there about how to be a nature journalist. You may own some of them. You may love some of them. I own a bunch. I love them as well. Um, they've taught me about drawing, and they've taught me about revealing my innermost thoughts. And um, yet, I don't find them useful. They haven't actually taught me to be a sharper observer of nature, or at least they haven't allow me to put my thoughts down in a way that I can then distill and predict the future because I understand, I can start to feel the rhythm of nature. I'll show you what I mean, kind of both the good and the bad of this of the kind of traditional book. Here's a, here's a page from one of these uh, how-to nature journals. And it's got a little bit of everything. It's got lovely watercolors. I wish I could, I could be an artist like this. It's got kind of um, attractive handwriting and a little bit of anecdote, a little bit of philosophy, but some good, there again, there's some good quantitative science. So, for example, if you focus in here, uh, here's something, one of 40 ground columns, it came up close, 
you've got a little bit of behavior. So that's actually in there. But you can see that even pulling this little bit of information from one day's of observation, there's a little bit of a, a labor, not just the pulling out, but actually even writing it. If I had to write and paint for every day that I went on with the nature, I would give up, sort of the way I gave up with all those many diaries that I had as a teenager. I imagine some of you had the same thing. You started the summer with your, your book and you were so excited and you got about four pages in and you just ran out of gas. Um, that's kind of the problem with it. So I'm all about uh, not roughing it, but smoothing it, making it super easy because that's the only way, at least for me, that I'm going to kind of pay attention to nature over the decades. And that's where you really start to see patterns in nature. In 1989, my sister-in-law, Tori Stevens, who's a wildlife biologist in British Columbia, gave my wife and me, or actually my wife, but I quickly co-opted it, what she called a 10-year gardening journal. And it wasn't about natural history, but I realized hmm, I can not only write down when we plant onions and when we harvest tomatoes, but um, I can start to record when I hear um, first robin singing in the spring, or wood frogs calling, or the first frogs. So I started and kind of took this journal over, and Tori just kind of came up with this format, as far as I know, pretty much on her own. And what, what my original journal that I co-opted here looks like is that lying flat, you have uh, 10 days across, and 10 days, 10 years rather, down the side with a little box. So that's all you get to write in. Now you can always put a little asterisk and cross correlate with a journal or a book of watercolor sketches, something like that, and say, you know, see page 14 of your journal where you pour your innermost thoughts or you actually do a pen and ink sketch. But these little squares don't give you much space to write more than a few abbreviated observations. And that actually is a virtue, as it turns out. So there are 100 squares open at a glance. After 10 years, I wrote to Tori and I said, ooh, would you give me another journal? I've, I've used that one up. And after 10 more years, would you give me another one? And so I've actually put in up my request for the fourth decade of journals. And I, I like to like the format better than our book. I'll explain why in a second. It just, it has more squares, um, and I'm used to that. Um, so I decided um, that I would approach um, Baron Heinrich. Um, we had, I'd known him when I was a graduate student at the University of Washington. He was at Berkeley on the faculty before he came to the University of Vermont. And um, then we kind of reconnected when we were both in New England. And I said, Baron, I've got a great idea for a book. Uh, I essentially want to tell people about nature journaling. And I want the book to be kind of, basically it's, it's about the, it's about the the naturalist. It's about the owner of the book. It isn't about us. And we'll write a little preamble. It'll be kind of like a, the instruction manual to a, a lawnmower. You look at it once and then you file it away and then the rest is for you. So that was the original idea of the book. I said, I'll do all the work. Uh, what I'd love from you is your observations as a naturalist, your gravitas, your name has got to give it some home, and some of your sketches. And he said, um, Wow, fabulous, no work, book, um, and all I've got to do is give you some sketches. So he handed me a thumb drive, and I took it back. This is in his cabin in, uh, uh, in Well, um, in northern Maine. And um, it turned out that the thumb drive had 900 watercolor paintings that nobody had ever seen before, <laughs> and he'd just been collecting. So um, he showed me his first journal. He has been nature journaling longer than I have. In fact. He began his nature journal when he was a 12-year-old boy. And this is a close-up of uh, one of the pages in his nature journal. He'd just come from Germany. His family had fled Poland uh, during the war. Um, if you haven't read The Snoring Bird, the biography of his father and a bit of an autobiography, it's just a, a beautifully told story. Um, his father actually stole mouse traps from the Berlin Museum and he used it to capture rodents so he could feed his family during the food shortages at the end of the Second World War, after the war. So they immigrated to Maine 
in the uh, 1950s. Baron is just learning English, so you see a few. You see a few. Um, let me move. I don't know why that arrow is there. Um, you'll see a few typos here on the shoulder, but the one that I think is most charming is that um, he's found a nest of a red-shouldered hawk, and he's monitoring it, and he says the eggs are slightly hatched. And by that, actually, what he meant was incubate. He didn't know the word for incubate. So they had, there was partial development of the eggs, but he just uh, reached out for the word hatch. Anyway, so that's, that was the, the origin of this um, project. It was published, the book, in uh, October 2017. And I think we probably started writing and organizing about two years, two and a half years before that. Any book, any book authors here? Um, or anybody with ambitions to be a book author. I'll just give, tell you one more thing about this. Um, I got online and there, I, I published a book, a scholarly book before, but I did, hadn't published kind of a more popular book and I didn't really know how one went about finding a publisher and persuading them to take on the project. So I got online, found out how to write a book a proposal, kind of followed what it said, and sent it off to Houghton Mifflin and some of the major publishers Got a few little bits of interest, but at the end of the day, nobody wanted to publish it. So I was about to give up, and someone mentioned a small publisher in Maine, and that was the first time that the the um, editors, the acquisitions editors, really, sh really just said, "Oh my gosh, this is fabulous! This is great!" I'm telling this story, by the way. This is a story about perseverance. <laughs> so don't give up. If you're an author and you're getting rejected, the point of this story is don't give up. So I didn't give up. I finally had somebody interested. I went and met with them. They just said, this is dynamite. Let's go, go, go. I went back to my office. Two days later, they wrote an email and said, we're so sorry to disappoint you. The editor says, we just don't have the bandwidth right now. And that was sort of the end of the road. I knew I had a good idea, but I couldn't find anybody who could sort of see it in the same way. And several people were also saying, why would you want, in the 21st century, a handwritten journal when everybody's using tablets and the cloud. So I just hadn't found the right match. This was the last shot. I thought, okay, what the heck, I'll vanity publish it and give it to my friends and anybody who's interested. A week or two after that, one of the acquisitions editor from the main publisher wrote me and said, you know, have you tried story publishing part of Workman Press in North Adams, Massachusetts? This is the kind of book they love. And I didn't want to mention it before because we wanted to publish it. But since we're not going to try that anyway, that's who ended up publishing it. When Baron, who has published more than 20 books, saw the galley proofs and the way they treated the color of his illustrations, he said, what am I doing with Hogan Mifflin? I should be going to the story publishers. So they, they were fabulous. But it was like the 15th uh, publisher that I approached. So stick with it. You'll get your, your book published. These are, uh, this is an example of one of the illustrations in, uh, that was on this thumb drive, and I knew, oh, this is a different book than I thought. It's not going to be a long or instruction manual, uh, but we're actually going to um, build a structure around it that's going to be even more useful and more beautiful. So um, this is us up in his cabin uh, brainstorming. We decided to, we're both teachers, and decided um, to dedicate the book to teachers, our greatest natural resource. I really feel that more and more as we kind of go into kind of a funny dark ages where we don't know the difference between fact and opinion and falsehood, and it's all getting blurred, and we don't know who the experts are to verify. And our only salvation is that for everybody to drop what they're doing and become a teacher. <laughs> we need teachers, we need good teachers, and, and we sometimes don't appreciate our teachers um, we also decided, Baron and I, since our, the kids are through college and uh, their house is paid off, to donate 100% of the royalties of the book to um, conservation and environmental education. So my portion, um, I'm donating to Maine Audubon, um, the Organization for Tropical Studies, which does a lot of work in Costa Rica, where I've done work, um, and Massachusetts Audubon, which is where I uh, kind of cut my teeth as a, as a naturalist, as a boy. And Baron is uh, giving his to the Forest Society of Maine. So if you're not members of Maine Audubon, um, 
just down the road, Gilson Farm is a fabulous resource. And they, they, you watch the busloads of kids coming from all over the state, Lewiston, Auburn, Portland, and they are, are doing a fabulous job in environmental education. So they, they deserve our support. So let me describe the structure of the Natural History Journal in our book. It's very much like my sister-in-law's journal, except it has uh, only four days per page, so eight across the top and only five years instead of 10. And I don't know why story publishing pushed that. It's a, it's a smaller format than, than my original spiral-bound um, journal made by my sister-in-law. So that's part of the constraint. Um, maybe they wanted to sell twice as many, because, and therefore it's only five years instead of 10. I think, though, what really pushed them was that they saw that the average person who may not yet be a naturalist or may not have had any experience with nature journaling would look at a 10-year project and think, oh boy, that's daunting. I'm not going to do that. But I might be able to do five. So, um, in any event, that's, that's, the, that's the structure. Eight days across, it's a high flat binding, so you can just uh, hold it open, and it goes for five years. And the advantage of this, well, I'll show what, why this spreadsheet format is so, is so useful. So these are some actual data from my journal. I transcribed them onto the format of the Naturalist Notebook, the book itself. But these are the actual things that I had written in the squares. And you can see it a couple of things. First of all, I don't write much. I don't write much because I don't have a lot of spare time. I suspect you don't have a lot of spare time. I keep my journal right by the kitchen window where I eat breakfast every morning. And I can uh, eat a piece of toast, and I can write with my right hand when I look out the window and I see something. And I, so I, I don't write much. I do it fast. I use abbreviations. And I, I save my feelings for another, another uh, book, perhaps. Um, this, isn't, this is really, I'm just about feeling the pulse of nature. I want to learn the rhythms of nature. So I use um, abbreviations, uh, typical of what ornithologists do. They, they'll take uh, four letters. So black cat chickadee, for example, would be B C C H, black cat C H chickadee. Um, but I want to show the advantage of a spreadsheet approach here. Maybe you've seen this already. Pick the pattern out. Um, why R W A stands for yellow rumped warbler and myrtle warbler, and rather than writing out. I, today I saw the first and writing out F-I-R-S-T, I just do one S-T, Y-R-W-A. And I know that that means the first yellow rump twirler. There's a glossary in the back of our book, so you can actually, uh, with an alphabetized, with all the letters of the alphabet, and you can put in your abbreviations and define them there. So if it's at all ambiguous, I really encourage you to do that. Um, so uh, in 2014, I saw on, on the 25th of April, and then I can see at a glance that this is a bird that tends to show up, at least based on these three years, in late April. Not a surprise to birders here, but I can kind of fine tune it and quantify it. And the reason I can is that I can scan my eye over a page. With my original 10 by 10 journal, if you were to ask me, when did red winged blackwings come back to my house? In on the Durham Road in Brunswick, over the last 30 years, I can tell you in, in less than two minutes. I would challenge Thoreau to do that in his <laughs> journal. Because each year has a separate huge book, and you have to thumb through it. But in the spreadsheet, it's, it's really great. And what's nice about it is that then you start to associate things. So I now know that when I see Forsythia coming in the bloom, I'm about to see yellow rum rollers, which actually kind of look like Forsythia. They have a little bit, they're called butterbugs, is another. Uh, for them. So you start to associate things. When I hear <coughs> green frogs in August start to replace bullfrogs, I know to go out to look for raspberries. That's when they ripen. So it gives you a, you, it gives, it connects things in nature in a different way than it would. You might lose that in a, in a normal journal format. Now, um, again, as I said, we got some pushback uh, from people about why in the world do you want to take out a pencil when you could type and write um, on a journal when you could put it in the cloud and share it like everything else with everybody in the world. 
And I actually think that's great. You, there's no reason you can't do both. So there are some fabulous citizen science websites. eBird, iNaturalist are terrific. Um, and in fact, this is, this is really one of the most amazing times to be a naturalist, I would say, the, the early uh, 21st century. <clears throat> the first time in history, I can go out in the woods. If I had a, I don't happen to have a cell phone, but if I had one, or if I'm with someone who did have one, and I saw a small moth in the woods, and I could take a picture of that moth, upload it to iNaturalist or one of the Lepidopterist websites, and have a team of expert, experts come to a consensus of what species of moth that was, while I'm in the woods in 10 minutes. Early in my career as a field biologist, if I wanted to know the name of an unusual insect, I would have to collect it, kill it, pin it, put it in a box, mail it to Washington, to the Systematic Entomology Laboratory, and hope that six months later I would get the opinion back of one person. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a great period to use technology to take pictures, to upload uh, your data, to participate in these important citizen science projects. But it's also a great time, maybe an important time, not to share everything or not feel compelled to share everything. I, I, I hate to tell you, um, nobody probably cares when the forsythia in your backyard flowers, <laughs> just like they don't care about mine. Um, I care. Uh, so it's sort of a, it's not a private thing, but it's a personal thing. I also think, and I, I have some empirical data as a teacher, that um, when you stop and write things down, as opposed to when you type, you know, kind of especially in a distracted way, it actually takes knowledge and memories and lodges them in a different portion of the brain that actually makes them more easily retrievable. I find that when I write things down, I actually remember it longer than when I type it. And I know that's true for my students. Even so, it isn't just old people. It's, it's it is. I think it is the human mind. Just like you, know, you wake up and you have a dream. You can remember your dream for about two minutes when you first wake up, and by noon it is gone. And I think that part of the brain where we store dream dreams is the same, it's related to the part of the brain, the brain where we uh, have memories that are only digitally reinforced. So, upload your stuff, share it on its business uh, <coughs> uh, websites, but, but I think it is a place for just slowing life down, putting a speed bump in your life, and uh, writing things down. So let me show you um, some of what you can do with a spreadsheet-like format, and, and just a simple, easy to do, easy in and easy out, and that's the important part, uh, journal. Uh, so the, I've been recording since 1991, when I see the first frost in my backyard from my kitchen window. And I'm gonna zoom in on these days, but just to show you the expansiveness. And you see a couple of gaps, and that's okay, those are, I don't know, sabbatical years, or I just wasn't paying attention, or I just didn't do it. But uh, that's okay. I'm, I don't, this is, there's no guilt here with this. It's, when you feel inspired, you put stuff down. And when you don't have the time or inclination, you don't. So take a look at these um, numbers. Here's the sequence beginning in the early 90s, and then I jumped down to the year 2017. This is the day of the first frost. So here's my first question for you. Um, if you look at these numbers, what do you, or these, these data, these dates. Things are changing. Looks like things are changing. And in what way? Coming later, later, later. later. Yeah, looks like they're getting later. We're not, well, look at the day today, September 26th. That's crazy. People are in shorts. Um, <laughs> uh, you didn't used to be in shorts in the early 90s uh, because they're several days of frost maybe by this point. But now it's fairly routine to be early, mid October, even late October before you get your first frost. Um, I remember when it snowed, September 30th. Um, and here, incidentally, is something that I do in my own abbreviated notes. If I make an observation that looks odd, spring peeper calling in January, but I am sure it really was one, I put an exclamation mark to, to alert myself to the fact that if I go back and look at that a year later, oh, that wasn't just being dyslexic or uh, a typo. That really did happen. So it really did snow on September 30th, 1992. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had some September snowfalls and October snowfalls, uh, but now it's it's often mid-November. So this is something that came in my own backyard, 
trust but verify about climate change in my backyard, the climate's changing. Lots of ways you can test that hypothesis and, and rule out the fact that climate change is a fraud, uh, at least <laughs> based on my observations of animals and plants and frost, it is getting warmer in the fall. Um, I really, one of the, uh, I, I had a lovely conversation, really a remark that someone came up and told me after buying the book. It was a woman from New York who said, you know, I was not brought up to be a naturalist. I had no idea even where to start, but I just had a feeling that I should know more about my neighbors, the plants and the animals around me. And she said, you know, I read the book, and the book said, oh, you can do it, you can do it. Um, start wherever you are, start with whatever interests you. And she said, okay, I didn't know where to start. I started by writing down the temperature on the thermometer every morning. That was my way of engaging with nature. And she said, the oddest thing happened. After several weeks of doing that, I started to smell flowers and to hear birds singing. Well, similarly, I started with kind of the obvious stuff. And, um, you know, the birds, the, the, the flowers, the trees. Um, but I started to branch out now, and I found that, that actually my capacity to be interested in and knowledgeable about, curious about other groups of organisms that I thought were kind of, I didn't pay any attention to them or thought they were difficult as I stand. So uh, dragonflies are something I started to pay attention to. I have another reason to do that. They're my plan B when birds go down the tube. Um, dragonflies are kind of, kind of like birds. They're very colorful, they're territorial, they're active in the day. You can, you can, they don't sing, but they do just about everything else. That's cool. So, um, so I'm, I decided, okay, I'm going to learn about dragonflies. And here's another thing you can do with your is to pull out the phenology or the timing across time of different species of dragonflies. So they're now great field guides to dragonflies of uh, the northeast and actually the west, as a matter of fact. And what I've done is just array them to show you what is this, you know, 20 odd species of dragonflies in my backyard and the period of time where I see them. And I want to point out a couple things. Um, this is the first great big dragonfly that you will see in a pond in New England. Um, and I didn't really recognize this until I started to pay close attention. Anybody know why they show up? They actually show up probably a week earlier than emerald, uh, American emeralds. Anybody know why, they, why this big species of dragonfly shows up first? This is something I learned just through the journal. Uh, turns out they're, of uh, this group, they're the only migratory dragonfly. They actually winter down south, and they come back. They don't have to emerge and metamorphose from the pond. They, they arrive as adults having migrated from the south. So that was interesting. And the other thing I uh, like to focus on, I'm really glad that I learned, is um, right about this time of year and for another month, maybe a month and a half, if you sit next to a pond or actually in a field, these companionable red dragonflies will land on your knees. Well, I now know that they are meadowhawks. And uh, cherry-faced meadowhawks have a cherry-colored face. And they and the autumn meadowhawk, meadowhawks are some of the last dragonflies that you'll see. Most of the early ones you can see, they just, they just, uh, <coughs> they got them. And they, they overwinter as uh, nymphs in ponds. So, um, good way to kind of expand your view of nature. Okay, so now I'm going to put you to work again. These are actual data of a different sort from my own journal, compiled from the late 80s to um, 2016, I think 2015. And what I've plotted is year on the x-axis here, the horizontal axis, and the date of appearance on the y-axis, or the vertical axis. So each of those points represent a particular year, say 2000, and a particular time where something appeared. Okay, everybody follow what this is? So tell me, if you were describing this pattern to somebody on the telephone, hey, I'm in a, I'm in a presentation, uh, I need an answer to number, question number two here. Uh, here's what I'm seeing. Well, how would you describe this? Species one is starting to appear earlier and earlier. Trending. 
Yeah, it looks like there's a little bit of a, a dent that this, this red line is kind of dipping, suggesting that as you get to more recent years, it's coming earlier. Good. In a predictable way or not a predictable way? There's, there's a huge bit of variation. And you can't tell me, is this going to, you know, in, in 2018, is this going to be early or late? You can't. You, you'd be hard pressed to say. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would not bet on that. So, two things. It looks like it's coming earlier and earlier, and it's highly variable between years. So this should be making you think a little bit about the biology and, and uh, kind of going through your mind, okay, who could this be? Let me contrast that with species two. Another, another species, exact same scale, slightly different dates, but the same number of days, I think that's a 30 day period there, and the same years. How would you describe this one? Much more consistent, much more predictable, much less variable. And you see a trend towards earlier? No. Anybody want to make a guess what these two species are? Yeah. Yeah. Is this a Canada goose? Super guess. And 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 essentially you're 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 in the right group. <laughs> Namely, it's a bird. And it's a bird that might how about the other one? Robin. Sorry? Robin. Robin? Uh, yeah, robins are a little weird because they actually do overwinter here and they can, they can sing at all different times, despite what I said about the first robin song in the spring. Um, uh, it's not a robin. Spring beavers. It's not an oral. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry? Spring beavers. Spring beavers. That's a terrific guess. So this is wood frogs up at the top and Baltimore Orioles down at the bottom. Wood frogs spend the winter in shallow depressions not far from a pond where they're going to go in and breed. Very temperature dependent, very snow level dependent. Baltimore Orioles spend the winter in northern South America, Central America. Their, the timing of their return is cued by day length, which has not changed over the last 30 years. So, this is a species whose biology is driven by temperature. This is a species whose biology is driven by photo period or daylight. Was there a question about some of those? Yes. Yeah. Do you ever use like, um, the technique of boundary days? And yeah, that would be a fabulous one, too. Yeah, yeah that, I don't for this. It's normally done with plants, of course, but, but it would work well here. Because I'm sure it's correlated with um, wood frogs come out, at least in our pond, when 10 or 20 percent or more of the pond is free of ice and it's above, it's mid 30s, high 30s and it's raining. That's when they come out. And I'm sure that that would be correlated with, uh, and also when there's just, the snow is mostly melted in the woods. So yeah, I visited with, um, with horticulture, but a lot of uh, fly fishermen would use it because we can tie them with the bugs and the fish. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, perfect. Well, that's a great example of that horticulture and Caddis flies, you could link those two and, and learn about the pattern of nature. Um, I have to tell you a funny story. Um, so Baltimore Orioles come back to my house May 7th, just about every year. Um, I couldn't believe my eyes two years ago. I got an envelope in the mail from our mail carrier. You take the Brunswick Times record, find newspaper. And she was offering a free subscription, year subscription to Brunswick Times record, if you could guess when Baltimore Orioles showed up in her backyard. <laughs> I thought, man, this is shooting fish in the barrel. This is so easy. Anyway, I was off by one day. Um, I, didn't, I didn't win the prize, but uh, I thought that was going to be easy. So there could, there could be some monetary. <laughs> so let me turn to um, five uh, certain tips about um, being a nature journalist, this is my, my philosophy anyway, and a lot of it is simply repetition of what I've told you before. Keep your records neat and easy. Um, as I say, this is where I have breakfast, there's my journal, there's my cereal, there's my pencil, and my, uh, I have a pencil and a journal. Couldn't be easier. I spend no more than 10 seconds writing each of these observations, then I get back to my busy day. Um, I'm looking out the window, and, and it's, it's super easy. Um, that's, I'm not a hugely disciplined person, so that's what's let me do this for 30 years. Not just effortlessly, but with real pleasure, increasing pleasure.
do simple experiments. Um, this is something we don't, I think, teach or model enough. Um, rather than just sit back on a couch and look at nature and say, isn't it grand, and watch nature videos, I'll go out and mow the little half the lawn, not the whole thing, and then go sit back and watch what happens while you drink iced tea, or put up a bird box. Those are all experiments. Or snap a twig and look at the, the drops of sap that come out and count them, and then do it again a week later. Uh, this is how you, I think, engage with nature, and you really can learn a tremendous amount. Uh, kind of a more experimental engagement. Um, Baron Heinrich is one of the most natural experimental scientists I know. Uh, you pick this up in all of his books, but when we were visiting once, um, I looked out the window, or I just happened to notice some activity to my left, and I looked out, and it was clear he had a bird feeder of some kind, but when I looked more closely, can you see what he has on the stump? <laughs> he's got a couple of mice that he snapped in his cabin, and while we were looking, a chickadee came down and plucked the fur, which they used to line their nest. So that's actually a useful thing to do if you happen to snap a mouse, don't just heave it in the trash, put it out on the stump and watch what happens next. Um, make friends who know things about nature that you don't. Um, some of you may have known Sam Ristich, the great mushroom guru. I just love walking in the woods with him. Uh, Ralph Pope is someone else. He knows a lot about lichens and mosses, which are hard groups to learn on your own. So if you can find a friend who knows more than you, or someone who knows about birdsong and you don't, stick with them, bring a pad and a pencil, and take notes. Um, there's a whole world of really <coughs> lovely people, slightly eccentric, who do field biology. This is the uh, annual gathering of the Maine Mycological Association. And if you haven't been on one of their forays, you'd love it. And they're super welcoming to people who know nothing. And they will, each one of the members will take you into their wing and just teach you all about the mushrooms of Maine. Um, kind of like doing experiments. Like get, get close to nature and, and use all of your senses. I had a um, student at Bowdoin who had come from Seattle, and uh, I think her family was also quite urban back a generation or two, and I had a caterpillar, and I wanted her to touch it, or at least look closely at it, but she was nervous, and she was standing back. And I said, how would you even be able to know how many legs this thing has if you weren't a little closer? And she said, I would Google it. Good <laughs> <laughs> sad. Um, but you want to get close to a luna moss uh, antennae, and then you can recognize the difference between males and females. Males have these very plumose antennae to pick up small pheromone molecules at low densities in the air and detect females. Uh, so there's just uh, that's just a matter of of being attentive, but being close to things, and then finally pass on your knowledge and put it into action. I'm going to give you an example again it's in my backyard. My wood frogs. Uh, this is on just a stone's throw from our house. And um, as you now know, in uh, late March, early April, the wood frogs come out. Here's a pair in what's called a plexus. That's what um, uh, when males grasp females, it's called a plexus. Here's a uh, freshwater leech attaching to the female's forelimb when it is fractured. And every year I go and um, count the egg masses in my pond, and I record when they come. And it's so easy to hear, so it's simple. I can sit at the kitchen table again, I hear it, I write it down. Um, I'll also show you how to sex wood frogs. you know how to tell males from females? Actually, all you need to see is that the thumb. The males are like Popeye, they have these great muscular thumbs, and the reason is that when they get a female in that plexus, other males try to butt them off, and dislodge them, and so natural selection, sexual selection has favored the evolution of super muscular thumbs in males <laughs> to hold on tight. In 2014, we had a banner year of eggs. Uh, we had, I think, 650 egg masses in the pond. Each egg mass has about 800 um, eggs in it. And hatching success was really high because the leech populations that year were fairly low. So there was an absolute river of tadpoles swimming around the pond. And on uh, June 14th, I believe it was, at 5 in the afternoon, my wife went out for a swim in the pond and came back into the house and said, 
Every stroke I took, I was hitting tackles. There are so many tackles this year in that pond. I went out at um, 1 o'clock the next day, 20 hours later, and this is what I found. Every single tadpole in the pond was upside down, showing me its white belly, and the floor of the pond was littered with corpses. So I did what any of you would do, which is grab a couple of corpses, put them in the freezer, and go out with some quad rats, and I counted the density of dead tadpoles and estimated there were 200,000 that had died in a 20-hour period. And then I got online, I thought, okay, well, what could have caused this? Who could help me understand this? And this led to the easiest scientific paper I ever wrote, I wrote it over the weekend practically, in collaboration with uh, Matt Gray at the University of Tennessee. He's a, the world's expert in amphibian diseases, specifically rhinovirus. And he did the molecular bi biology. He said, do you happen to save any specimens? And I said, of course, they're in the freezer, I'll ship them to you. Um, so he did the molecular biology, PCR, and, and uh, quantified the coronavirus. He said they came back glowing. So we published this paper, which got a lot of press because it was about death, which is always popular. And it was a sudden, well quantified, um, and we knew what the cause was uh, because of his lab work. And what this has done is actually changed the way in fisheries and wildlife now monitors vernal pools. It used to be they would get citizens to go out and look at pools, count egg masses, and then you're done. But you're not done because you need to return a month and a half later to see if the pond actually produced any surviving tadpoles. Um, uh, this is my, my grandfather, and uh, he was of a generation where he was sort of a gentleman hunter and shot all kinds of things. And I have four older brothers, and when we all uh, reached the age of puberty, uh, what he imagined the puberty, uh, he would summon us one by one down to his house and presented us with a shotgun and then take us out in the woods and fire off a couple rounds and show us how to be safe and, and manly with guns. So I was the fifth of five boys in a row. And when I came, um, instead of a shotgun, he gave me a double barrel, barrel pair of binoculars. Uh, so that's kind of how I got my start as a naturalist. And he taught me, instead of how to shoot a gun, he also later taught me how to shoot a gun, but taught me how to uh, just recognize birds by their song. And it just, for a 12-year-old boy, absolutely uh, magical. Um, just to wind it up now, I'm going to end with a nature moment. Um, but after we published the book, I read this poem by Mary Oliver. This is just one of the stanzas of the poem called Sometimes. And this actually scooped us as well. This is the book. Uh, pay attention, be astonished, and tell about it. There is some urgency. Um, the Oxford Junior Dictionary, which used to have the words acorn, pasture, and fern, needed to make room, so they dropped those words and replaced them with log and oatmeal and cut and paste. So if we're going to listen to Anna uh, Comstock, um, we really do need to um, remind the children what a fern is and what a, an acorn is. So the last thing then I'll end with is uh, a two, a one and a half minute uh, video. I took off last year and decided that um, kind of in response to cuts at the Environmental Protection Agency and kind of despair about uh, support for conservation and environment, and environmental quality, that I would try to make a video every week in my backyard about some aspect of nature. And I actually made it. I just This morning I was working on the very last one, so I'm, uh, I'm done. But I thought I would just show you one. You can find these very easily uh, on the Bowdoin website, or the main Audubon website, or on YouTube, and they're just called Nature Moments. So just Google Nature Moments Bowdoin, or Nature Moments Wheelwright, or Nature Moments. Uh, made out of and you'll find them. So this is one of the... They're on Facebook, too. Not on Facebook, but... Yeah, I'm not on Facebook, so I don't know. <laughs> Good, yeah, you I didn't are do... on Facebook. Oh, okay. I've seen you there. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do it, though. <laughs> no, I think we're even on Twitter. <laughs> or, or book face, as my mother-in-law says. <laughs>
Have you noticed how much of the world is covered in lawn? It looks pretty, but think how much time we spend mowing it and how much gas we burn. And lawns seem a little lifeless. I wonder what would happen if you didn't use any pesticides or fertilizers and just let your lawn be for a little while. When I tried that experiment, the next thing I knew, three dozen different kinds of flowers appeared out of what I had thought was a monoculture of boring grass. Mints, like this heel all, delicate bluets, lemon buttercups, lacy yarrow, it's true that most of the flowers were actually not native to the U.S. They were originally introduced from Europe and Asia. But that's okay. They added to the biodiversity of my backyard. And check out what I found visiting the flowers. Pearled crescent butterflies, bumblebees, hoverflies, crab spiders eating hoverflies. They, in turn, provided food for the pair of Phoebes that nested on our porch. The original inspiration for lawns came from the manicured estates of the French and British aristocracy, visible proof of their wealth and leisure. In America, the tidiness of your lawn is almost seen as a reflection of your moral character. What better way to demonstrate that than to share some of your lawn with other animals and plants? Thanks very much. Do we have time for a few questions? Yeah. Be happy to answer any questions or hear your own thoughts. And, and then it looks intentional and quite lovely, plus it's biodiverse. 
It's, it's, and plus you save all that time. <laughs> I like it, you're not spending your weekends mowing. And so you're sitting there learning your dragon class. So we did mow the border and mow the path, and we actually put a sign up that said pollinator project. Because <laughs> <laughs> someone who started to complain about it being unkempt, they might see that there was a purpose. Maybe hopefully you'll, you'll start a uh, bat and then it'll spread over your neighborhood. Yeah. We're both our neighbors, and uh, we're doing likewise. But oh, uh, yes, uh, we have started likewise. We've already done it. Yeah, you no. have no. lots of <laughs> Talk to them, they have lots of flowers. And butterflies. And this year, I went to the university professor of Minnesota who set fire to her wall and then put a habitat sign up for her because she got sunned. <laughs> well, fire, actually, that's, a, that's another treatment. That's a great thing. And it gets back to doing an experiment. Yeah, all this is good. When you mow, you've done an experiment. When you stop mowing, you've done an experiment. This is experimental science is to pay attention afterwards that it turns into really watch because I we haven't mowed for a long time. If you watch the plants migrate, that's yeah. I know, like watching plants migrate. I know. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. great fun. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. And now I see these putting green like emerald lawns and it, it, they feel so nauseated, especially when I go into one of the Big box stores, and I see the rows of poisons. Mm -hmm. um, um, I um, they're getting bigger. They're what? The rows are getting bigger. They are. No, it's and and the stuff is deadlier. These neonicotinoids are really quite bad. Um, I uh, used to teach a lab at Bowdoin when I first joined the faculty there 30 years ago, where we take the students out, and they only had an hour and a half or two to collect caterpillars in September, but they. The exercise was to record large samples of caterpillars in different microhabitats, look at their behavior, their color pattern, do they, are they camouflaged, are they brightly warning colored. I went out to film caterpillars for one of the last nature moments <coughs> with my wife. We split up, we looked for an hour in August, <coughs> and we could not find one caterpillar. So it's a, and that's, and you probably know those butterfly numbers. Monarchs are, are rebounding, which is but butterflies in general uh, are, are so much scarcer than they were 30 years ago and way scarcer than in my childhood. It's pretty astonishing. And I think it really, it's because people's lawns are just drenched with poisons. Um, but that's like that. They're right. also going to have that. And they're going to have that. Every time they go, they take away the butterfly habitat. And then they say, remember there used to be fireflies? Yeah. I write about all this stuff on Facebook all the time. And the other thing is, if you do find that you do have blueberry bushes, that means you have acidic soil. Throw on a little more peat, throw a little soil acidifier, and encourage it. If you have lawn underneath your trees, throw down peat or a little bit of soil acidifier, and the moss will come up and be so happy. And that number five uh, soil will be sour, and it will hate, and the grass will hate it, and it will just kind of go away. And you don't have to mow moss. That is soil science. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I was just wondering, you showed us a picture of a butterfly, it was a pearl or something. Pearl crescent. Mm -hmm. Crescent, okay. I, I saw that the other day and I didn't know what it was. So. Yeah. yeah, super common. Yeah, it's one yeah. yeah there, there are you know, inornate ringlets, pearl crescents, um, some of the fritillaries are still around, but boy, the diversity is, is way down. Did you see painted ladies this year? Uh, Usually, I see a number in the spring, I would say less and less each year. Yeah, and that, I, I'm now quite excited when I see them, and they used to be the commonest, one of the commonest early butterflies. I saw hundreds of them last year, I saw three of them. Insect populations do tend to cycle, so, and monarchs are a great example, because I was despairing about them for a couple of years, and this has been a great summer for it. Yeah? I pretty much do the same thing you do with my journaling. Um, a lot of times I take a bet about when the ice. So I was on a bet on the first snow when the ice finally gets from the backyard that never gets any sun. But you didn't talk about anything indoors lately. I've had a lot of ants in my house, and every year I write down when the ants come <laughs> and when they disappear because I have to take all my sugar jars and put them in the same place and you know, get the tight fitting lids and take the honey. But, have you ever looked inside your own home for the spiders and the, the 
what is inside. I, I have, and there's a nature moment entitled House Invaders. <laughs> <laughs> so watch that. Yeah. So we the long-legged cellar spiders are, are big in our house, yeah. and of course the Asiatic lady bird beetles, um, and, oh, yeah. uh, and then the um, Western conifer seed bugs. That, um, uh, those are the, the big three that we really concentrate on. But, but the ants are, are fabulous. You get this great succession right. of, of ants in your in our kitchen over the course of the day. <laughs> so, Dr. Yes. What's the most surprising notation that you've made in your journal? Oh, wow. I, I, I would look for two or three exclamation marks, and I would find it. It would take me a couple minutes, but I could answer it if I had it. Um, I, I think, you know, this isn't that surprising. The first time I, I saw it, I was surprised, but now I realize it's regular. And that is thunderstorms in January. <laughs> you go you go into the water cooler at work, and uh, in late January, and people run, oh my god, could you believe it? Yeah. Last night there was a thunderstorm. I think, well, there was one in 2016, and 2013, and 2011. <laughs> that, it's regular, that's what happens to me. Um, what else? Uh, oh gosh, I'm drawing a little bit of a blank. Um, Someone just here today that surprised me. I don't know. A fun thing, I mean, this isn't all that surprising, but it's sort of, it's one of those discoveries that, that is fairly fresh for me. I, I've learned where a Phoebe spends the night in our backyard. And I just stumbled upon it. I flushed by mistake when I was doing some chore in the evening, and I, it came out of the shrub. So the next night I went out and looked in the shrub, and he sits on the same twig every single night. So I, I just love to go out with a flashlight. And see, yep, he is still there. I can't believe he sits on that twig. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Two questions. One is, um, do you know what caused the Rana philosophy? The Rana virus? Right, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, the, yeah, so, Rana is the um, uh, scientific name for the, the genus of the ashes, the mold, it's no longer used, but of wood frogs, bull frogs, green frogs. That's Rana. So, it's a virus that attacks frogs. And it came over from Africa probably with African clawed frogs, the Xenopus, and they, they use them in laboratory research and also apparently for pregnancy tests, for some reason they use, they use this frog. So that brought the virus over, it got out in the late 1980s and started to appear in the wild in the 80s and 90s. And now that we're paying attention, we realize it really is a big problem. I, I would be very sad if the spring comes when I don't hear wood frogs, but it, it, it's very hard on the wood frogs, and it's very hard on the spotted salamanders. And part of the problem with this virus is that it's tolerated by green frogs and bullfrogs and painted turtles, so they harbor it. And so it's not as if you could wipe out a population of wood frogs and you would wipe out the virus. The virus sticks around. So it's the, the, what will save the wood frogs is going to be the evolution of resistance to the virus. So hopefully there are some genetically distinct wood frogs with the capacity to survive this, this virus. And your second question? Um, it, it's been a source of conversations on Facebook, people I know, but, and I've witnessed it myself, unbelievable amount of dead squirrels on the road. <laughs> and, <laughs> just wondered if you had yeah. it. So that's, that's a function of an unbelievable amount of, of, of live squirrels <laughs> um, this year uh, that are then forced out by high population density, forced to disperse. And people are also seeing not just dead squirrels on the roads, but squirrels swimming across the lakes and rivers, which uh, I saw for the first time this summer. That was that was a weird sight. Um, so it's all about, I, 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 at least this is my understanding, it's all about the fact that last year was a huge acorn year and beech mast year. So I am quite positive that the squirrels are going to take it in the shins this winter. It doesn't look like it. there's going to be much winter food. So they had high survival last year, and whenever you get that, then you tend to get aggressive interactions between males. Young subordinate males are forced to disperse across the road and they get killed. Hmm. Um, in one of my nature moments, by the way, called Outsmarting Squirrels, which is about how to outsmart the nature bird feeder, I put in a plug for examining road kills, actually. And I learned some cool things when I picked up some dead squirrels, so I invite you on the drive home and you see a gray squirrel. Scoop it up, look at their nails. How crazy, look at their toes. They're not as long as mine, but they are very long, and that explains how they can leap through the air 
and catch a branch and not tumble. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question about age. I have a niece who's in second grade and she calls herself a nature girl and I think she would love to journal. Uh, any advice for a second grader? Make it easy. <laughs> Make it fun. <coughs> um, and not be the way I was with my kids, maybe a little bit too heavy handed. Um, in the end, our kids came around, they love nature, but they raised through all their eyes and having a teacher as a mother. Um, so, yeah, just fun activities and at their own pace. And then, and, and I guess the really important thing is to, for a moment, pretend you're not afraid about deer ticks and let them get in the leaf litter and let them cover themselves in leaves and then just do a good tick jack at the end of the day. Um, but don't make them afraid of nature. Uh, that, that's the best. And just give them up to me. The rest, it's so natural to, to be curious about nature as a child. So, uh, but when you see so many parents just mentor caution, and, oh, don't sit down there, and uh, I don't know. Any other parents have any uh, suggestions for how to make people, young people interested in nature? Well, one of my favorite things for the fall is um, the cat syrup tree, and when the leaves get really dry, they smell like cotton candy. So, like, kind of just assimilating it to like farm sweet things. Well, what kind of tree? The cat syrup tree. Cat syrup. Is it is it an ornamental? Is it that's? I, I think it's it's not a native, but uh, I don't know if it's yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, and, and it's got Japan and yeah. it's a, a Japanese ornamental. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Well, it's pretty well tree, I bet. Doesn't have a relationship with anything here. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so it wouldn't be a good place to look for insects. The, or caterpillars. Yeah, yeah. yeah. These introduced species tend not to be. But it's got a good smell. I, I want to learn it. Yeah, it's fun. It smells like that. Well, there's lots of things smell. I mean, cherries, all cherries and, and twigs in winter. So that, actually, that, that's a great yes, idea. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which is sassafras, fabulous. Um, yellow birch. Um, get them, get the kids to smell things mm -hmm. and taste things. Have them taste a quaking aspen. Taste nasty. They'll, they'll never forget it. Um, but it also cures headaches because it has salicylic acid in it. Um, but but it's just those sorts of vivid experiences. I think are. I mean, I can remember. I can remember so vividly someone hypnotizing a blue jay. And he laid it on the ground on his back. The way you hypnotize a bird, he, he caught it in a mist net at an Audubon sanctuary. And, and took the bird out, the bird is struggling. He stroked it gently on the breast, and he laid it on the ground and took his hand away, and the blue jay just sat there. Mm -hmm. And I have done this hundreds of times with Golden Stone since because it was so, so memorable for me. And then he just said, Here, take your finger and hold it. And I hold it and it flew away. <laughs> Those sorts of simple things, um, I think, can really sort of charge the life. Is it that they're terrified, like those fainting goats? I I don't know. I, my hypothesis has been that it's it's an adaptive reaction. If you let's say have been pinned by a, by a, a cooper's hawk and it's put yeah. its wings on you and it's got its talons pressing into the ground, or a fox has its paw on you, and then the fox you know, grooms himself because you're not moving, that that might be the opportunity to mm -hmm. So they just play dead, but I don't know. And they, they totally conk out. Mm -hmm. uh, robins you can do too and go in that lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Try it. If you, get, if you get a bird in your garage or something, uh, just capture it, put your hand in a, like a peace sign around their neck so you hold them without squeezing the breathing of their chest. And, Put their back on your palm, so that's the way to hold a small bird, and then gently stroke their breast, their breast without touching their feet. If you touch their feet, it resets them. <laughs> so you just gotta touch the breast softly, and you get softer and softer until I'm not even touching them. And then just like you're shoveling a pancake off a spatula, get them on the ground on their back. Yeah, you can find a bird. You can catch a bird. I think I must have done that in the bird 
as a child. <laughs> yeah, that's how I had one figure. But I, I did that kind of, but I didn't know what that, because it, it had flown into the house and I had captured it. And, but I must have done that. I'm like, oh, you killed it. And you were probably just trying yeah, to comfort it. Like, like, you were hypnotizing it, as it turned out. So then it became a pet. Well, thank you very much.